Welcome to Embedded Open Source Summit. Today I'm going to be speaking about uh, camera and ISP drivers using the V4 L2 media controller framework. So I think oftentimes uh, uh, many people are very familiar with V4 L2 because of its age, but not everyone is uh, very sure about what media controller framework is. And uh, if, if that's your question, I think you're at the right place. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. I won't be covering a lot of V4 L2 as such, but mostly talking about the media controller framework aspect of it and how it's very suitable to build uh, camera and ISP drivers. So that's going to be my focus for, for the talk today. Uh, so let's first start and look at the uh, evolution of cameras uh, in general to understand uh, the why uh, this transition from V4L2 to V4L2 media controller happened, right? So in the early or mid 2000s, uh, cameras were mostly built with using external ISPs. Uh, ISP stands for image signal processor. And it's usually the processor that does some basic signal uh, correction for raw image sensors to make it produce images that can be viewed by, uh, you know, by, by humans, right? So uh, the external ISPs uh, back in that time were either based on USB cameras, uh, which were based on the UVC protocols. That means the USB camera had a built-in external ISP in there. Uh, there were other instances of external modules that were uh, built with parallel camera interfaces because that was uh, that MIPI based serial camera serial interfaces weren't out at that point. And then you had CSI and CSI2 based camera interfaces. So that was kind of what, uh, like until mid 2000s, uh, this is kind of what was available. Uh, then things started getting interesting. SOC started including ISPs inside of them, right? And this was purely a cost-driven approach because, uh, you know, cost of transistors and stuff started going low. So SOC started uh, now putting the ISPs in there, which used to earlier be external, right? And I think this started, this trend started with OMAP3 and soon to follow Qualcomm. And these days, most SOCs have some sort of ISPs built inside of them. So let's take a quick look at what external ISPs look like. So I've drawn a draw uh, dashed uh, red line, which shows the API abstraction layer. And then in any camera, right, you'd always have a raw image sensor, and these are typically bare. Uh, bare is a specific pattern uh, which is used to capture light uh, using the image sensor array. And the basic idea here is that there's twice the amount of green pixels as compared to red and blue. And one of the main, one of the jobs of the ISP is to correct for this and then actually produce a red, green, and blue pixel for every pixel. Right, uh, and so this bare sensor is typically uh, over some sort of an interface, some kind of camera capture interface. The the data is fed into an external ISP, uh, and that ISP basically corrects for one of these things, like I said, uh, de bearing, uh, and then it does a lot of other image processing activities, and then finally the processed image is sent out via another camera capture interface to the SOC or host PC in this case, right, and this was the API abstraction layer because you know the hardware was largely external, so Linux software had to deal with you know this camera interface and all of this. So V4L2 was really suitable for this, and that's what a normal V4L2 camera stack would look like. So you'd have hardware at the bottom layer, you'd have a V4L2 driver, and then finally you'll have a V4L2 application uh, around here, right? And and then the flow of the application would look like this. You know you'd First, start with querying capabilities, querying your camera. You'd set up formats. Uh, you'd request buffers, query buffers. Then you'd start skewing buffers, and then then you do a state change, and you change the state of the camera to stream on. And after that, it's a constant loop of dequeuing, you know, consuming those buffers, and then queuing them back. And that loop continues for as long as you're streaming. And when you're when the intent to stream uh, goes away, you 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 call a stop stream API. So this was the typical V4L2 application flow. However, let's take a look of how things change with internal ISPs. You still have the same bare uh, raw sensor, uh, external, right? Uh, but, that, uh, but then through the camera capture interface, now the frames go into an ISP, which is now contained inside of that of an SOC or host PC, right? So what uh, what's basically happened is that API abstraction layer has moved right now. Now you certainly need to worry about managing this ISP within Linux, right? And uh, so let's now see, just like how we saw the evolution of cameras, we have to also look at the evolution of V4L2, right? So with external ISPs, 
uh, V4L2 was the, the old V4L2 was pretty good for this. So it provided APIs uh, that allowed to view a camera as a whole, right? And you could view a camera as a collection of various controls and usually a single image or a video stream, right? That was, that was the normal level of abstraction and V4L2 was pretty good for this. But with internal ISPs, now the, only the bare sensor is there externally. ISPs are now contained inside the SOC. Complexity has grown many fold. As these ISPs are fairly complex, they could have various different architectures, right? And to support this is what media controller fragment fr framework was added. And it actually just augments V4L2 to help deal with just such complexities, right? Uh, so it's not changing V4L2 very much, but just adding stuff on top of it to, to make it more friendly for ISP-like devices. There are other uses for media controller like uh, DVBs, but, uh, which I'm not going to be covering, but I'm only covering the ISP aspects of it. So for the rest of the presentation, we need, we need to take some sort of an example ISP. So this is a very, very generic ISP. It's not a real one. It's just a mock kind of an ISP, but many of the ISPs should contain similar blocks. So, you know, as usual, you do have a uh, external bare image sensor and you do have an I2C controller many times to, to talk to this uh, image sensor over the I2C bus and you could basically configure it, uh, change states, you know, do various controls like exposure, gain, or whatever special controls that particular image sensor might have. You do have a CSI2 interface uh, through which the image stream enters into the first block inside the SOC, which is typically known as the CSI2 controller, or the, it's also known as the CSI2 RX because it's the receiver of, of the uh, frames, right? And uh, there are other interfaces too. Uh, you can still have uh, parallel interfaces, though for many years, CSI2 has been the de facto standard on top of DeFi. There are other Phi protocols that are being associated with CSI, like the CFI, uh, but the most common image sensors out there, the most popular ones uh, are CSI2 and DeFi combination, like I've shown here, right? And once, once uh, the job of this block is to take the serial interf the, the image stream over the serial interface and convert it into some sort of a bus-based uh, image feed to the rest of the ISP so that the ISP can inline process these, these pixels and do various uh, signal corrections to it, right? So one, uh, this is a very simple ISP. So the first stage here is a black level correction. So that basically removes for uh, you know, all the, all the different analog gains that the image sensor has that needs to be corrected so that a black looks like a black. That's, that's the block, that's the job of this block. And it's typically determined through some sort of calibration process, which is stored on some non-volatile memory. And then you, you kind of apply that correction on a frame by frame basis. And you, you do modify them when your uh, gains change. So then there's a defective pixel correction. Now this is done because during the sensor manufacturing process, there oftentimes there are dead pixels or defective pixels, and you do need some sort of a block inside an ISP to correct for those, so that, that's the basic job of this block. Uh, now, the, the next block is a demosaic, so that's basically the block that's going to change the bare pattern into RGB, typically, but it could also convert it to YUV, but most, most demosaic blocks will change it into an RGB format. Uh, following that could be like a color space correction, uh, you know, this is just to make the image look better, more more appealing to humans, right? Uh, and then following that, there could be like a scaling or further color space conversion blocks, right? And and then there's typically a DMA at the end of it, uh, to, just to write out the frames out, out to DDR memory. So there's a DMA block there. Uh, most ISPs will also have some sort of statistics blocks, which will be tapped at somewhere in the pipeline, typically before the demo sake but there are cases where it could be after the demo mosaic as well. Um, and those statistics can also get written out to DDR. And the reason for these statistics is so that there's a runtime aspect of an ISP, which is typically known as the 3A algorithms, uh, and where the 3A stands for autofocus, uh, auto white balance, and auto exposure. And these algorithms are looking at hardware statistics produced by the ISP hardware and they're on the fly making adjustments and you know making the image always look better. This is particularly needed for any preview or video based uh, usage of an ISP, even for snapshot as, as such, because you first run a preview and make sure that the preview looks good 
and then take a picture, right? So, so it's very essential for uh, good image quality. So, so that's basically a quick run of this very simple generic ISP. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about media controller. Like, like, like I've introduced the problem statement before that ISPs have pro multiple processing blocks. So they can be connected to form processing pipelines or graph, like the way we saw in the previous diagram. So media controller actually allows to represent such processing blocks uh, using media device model. Uh, now what's a media device model? So media device model consists of these following objects. So there's, a, there's something called as a media entity. That is a basic media hardware or software processing block. A media pad is a connection pad that allows connecting one entity to another via links. So each entity would have at least one or more pads normally. And then there's a media link, and these are the connection between these pads. So, so these links could further be like, you know, interface link that's between a Linux kernel interface and an entity. A data link is purely between two pads and an entity, two pads, you know, in two different entities. And ancillary, uh, ancillary link, uh, this is some sort of a logical link between two entities. So the normal devices that fall into this category are lens actuator for the autofocus and flash devices. So here's a simple diagram of media device model uh, explained. Uh, and we have three entities here. We have entity A, entity B, and entity C. So the black arrows that you see are the media links, like we saw from the previous slide. And these are the media pads. Now, entity C looks like it doesn't have a media pad, but this is a special kind of an entity that has an implicit pad, basically, so because you can always connect to it. So that's why it's not shown here, but it, it does have an implicit pad. Uh, now let's take a look at relationship between a media device and V4L2, right? The same same diagram, you have the three entities. Uh, the green blocks, right, in, in this diagram are often known as V4L2 subdevised entities. So you can roughly think of them as they are, they are participating in the ISP pipeline. They do produce data, but not directly to DDR. For, most, for the most part, right? But they do, the data flows from one entity to the other. Whereas the yellow blocks that you see in, in the media pipeline graphs are video device entities. And these typically either write out or read, in some cases, uh, uh, image data via some sort of a DMA. So rough mental model is green block means it's mostly controls, a bunch of different controls. Data is still flowing through it. You can stream on and stream off, but you don't directly pull uh, image data out of it. But if you see a yellow block, then it's it also may have controls, but it will most definitely have some sort of a DMA that writes out the image data or statistics data. So let's take a, let's take a quick refresher on the same generic ISP. Uh, so you have all the different blocks, and now let's see how we can represent this as a as a media in the media device model. So this is a straightforward representation, which is one-to-one -one mapping. So everything you saw in the previous block diagram is, is now there here. And rightfully, all, all the control only entities have been marked as green. And there's two DMAs, as you saw in the previous diagram. So they are video device entities. So there's one called the scalar here, and the other one is called the statistics. Now, arguably, you could, you could simplify this a little bit. Uh, if, if all these three IPs are coming from the same, uh, are authored by the same company, uh, or coming from the same place, you could club them together and simply have, do a simplified pipeline diagram like this, you know, so where you have an image sensor, CSI2, and this generic ISP that encapsulates the defective pixel correction, demosaic, as well as color correction. And then finally, you have the same two output videos, which is the scalar and the statistics. So this, this, this is actually a decision to be made by the designer of the software for this ISP as to what kind of uh, you know, media and entity to actual pipeline relationships you want to do. And uh, it, it also depends on what kind of controls or data flows out of it. So this is a decision process. But the media controller uh, framework is very flexible and allows you to build different types of pipelines. So the next important thing is to see the relationship between media controller and V4L2. So in this diagram, as you can see, the, the large red 
uh, circle is, is the V4L2 device. So mental model here is that every ISP will be a single V4L2 device. That's the general, general understanding. And that device is going to contain multiple sub-devices, those green blocks that we saw in the previous diagram, uh, and then a bunch of video devices, one or more. And these are represented inside the V4L2 device, the struct V4L2 device data structure, right? And now in each of these sub-devices and video devices, there is an embedded media entity object, right? And uh, the relationship between these media entity objects are maintained by the media device data structure that's contained inside of the V4L2 device. And it basically, the V4L2 only sees all of this as a collection of various sub-devices and video devices, but media entity gives a ISP-like representation of it in the form of a graph, right? So, so it knows that this particular device is connected to the next one, and, and so, so, so it, it kind of represents the pipeline. So that's kind of what media entity does uh, in addition, uh, in, you know, how, that's how it complements the, the V4L2 framework in allowing representation of such graphs. So now let's take a look at the media controller API in general and understand what are the different APIs available. I'm not going to be covering a lot of V4L2 APIs here. I'm just focusing mostly on the media controller aspect of it. So most devices, right, uh, likely the, the core device that owns the ISP's uh, V4L2 device structure is going to make this call. It's called the media device register. And it is often followed by an initialization call called media device in it that sets up the, the, the media device object. And as a part of this call, you will see that uh, a media device node also gets created. It's like dev media followed by some number. And the registration also sets some sort of file operations on, on, on this media device because it does support uh, ioctal calls, which can be done on the user space. So user space, once it sees this slash dev slash media uh, device node, uh, like at least at this early stage of registration, you cannot query much, but once the de device uh, and all the sub devices and video devices are registered, you're gonna see uh, there'll be a bunch of different ioctals that'll allow you to query this device. You can look at the media device information. You can enumerate entities. You can enumerate the links. You could even set up links, so if you need to connect two pads together with a link, that such APIs are available. You could get the existing graph topology, so that lets, that lets you know what does the device look like. And finally, you could also allocate a media request. So that these are, these are sort of the operations available here. Uh, a video sub-device. So, so here, let's take a look at what all initializations for media controller are done by a video sub-device. So here we're going to see that uh, one of the core things is to initialize the media entities objects function. So, so there's an enum inside the kernel. So that allows you to classify your sub device as one of these, you know, video composer, pixel formatter, uh, encoder, converter, LUT, scalar, statistics, encoder, decoder, and ISP, right? The other thing you can do here is actually in, uh, set up the number of pads because uh, you, uh, as corresponding to the hardware, right? So you, need, you can set the pads. You can also decide which of these pads are source pads versus sync pads. And you can also indicate via flags if the pads cannot be, that, that they must be connected and can't be left dangling, which is typically true for hardwired ISPs when it's not very flexible. So hardware is only built one way, so, so you could put that flag and then actually enforce that connection. There are also a bunch of media entity operations that are available. So uh, these, these are a few. One of them is firmware notepad. So this is normally used to determine pad number for uh, async graph devices. I'll cover this a little bit in, in a future slide. This link setup, so this is going to uh, notify the entity about link changes. And then there's link validate. So this is where you can validate compatibility. So if some if user space tries to connect two pads, then those pads, those corresponding media entity object can validate and see if you know can I accept the data format, you know, resolution and things like that. So so those those sort of operations can be can be performed inside the link validate. So user space it can scan scan the media pipeline, 
uh, find subdev entities and discover the number of pads and whether they are source or sync. And they can also query the function of that entity. So if user space needs to make some decision based on what function this entity is, uh, is providing, it can do that over here. So that's because whatever function got set over here can, is also queryable on the user space. So video device is pretty similar to that of a sub device. I think it's just implicitly has one pad in it. Think of it that way. And the same ops apply the media ops just like you saw on the previous slide. Uh, the, even the function can be set over here. Let's take a look at some of the other APIs here. So, so there's APIs to, to set up link. So this is typically used in drivers to connect to media pads. And this is very true for hardwired ISPs that are not you know, user changeable. Like data flows from this block to that and that's not really very changeable inside the software, right? So, so in those cases, uh, such links can be set up inside the driver itself. And only things that are flexible and changeable on the fly, you want to allow the user space to, to link with, right? There's APIs. Uh, this is not exhaustive. There's a lot more APIs. I just handpicked a few which were more interesting. Uh, media entity find link. This can be used to find the link between two pads. Media entity remote pad unique uh, or pad first. So this is used in the async uh, graph sub devs, which I will cover in a moment. There's helpers to get the V4L to sub dev from the media entity. So this is, this is helpful when you're doing validate, for example, uh, link validate. So you, you, you'd want to check the format currently set, right? And for that, you need the V4L to sub dev object. So this kind of a helper is, is here. Uh, create ancillary link uh, is used for you know, lens and autofocus actuator sub devices. So user space, um, I think we mentioned this in the earlier slide. It can uh, query the graph topology by calling the media IOCG topology. And this is often done with the, there is a utility in V4L utils package, which is called media-ctl, media CTL tool. Um, it is a very good tool and it's basically has a lot of this functionality that can be done in user space implemented as a part of that tool. It's a command line tool. So if you do a media CTL minus P, it's going to print out the existing graph topology. So you're going to see what's connected to what and whether they are connected or what formats are, what are the default formats and all those different details. I will share an example in one of the upcoming slides. And user space can also set up links. Like I said, things that are not hardwired and connected, user space has an ability to go and link things together if, if it's allowed. And if, if the user space needs to do that, if to via a command line tool, it can use the same media CTL tool with the minus minus links command line option. So let's look at some of the pipeline APIs that media, media controller provides. So, so there's a media pipeline start. What this does is it starts the media pipeline and it increments a start count uh, member. So start count is mostly like a reference counting so that you know that you know the media pipeline has started and you keep ref counting it. So this is typically helpful for multi-stream video devices where you, you, you want to turn on the media pipeline once and then as new streams get added to the application, you don't need to keep re rerunning and restarting the pipeline. So, so such this count can be monitored for, for, for those purposes. Media pipeline stop again stops it and it uses the start count until it goes down to zero, the pipeline is still kept active and then when it goes to zero, that means no one needs this pipeline to be active. It's at that time the pipeline would shut down. There are also other APIs to walk the graph. So there's a media graph walk in it. It initializes the graph and then there's a start. So you need to call this before doing a graph walk. And next is the video graph walk next is going to give you the next entity as, as you're walking the graph, right? And then the, finally, there's a cleanup. So, so these, these, these four APIs are normally used together. And so these APIs are normally called from the main ISP, uh, the driver part that manages the entire ISP. And it is used for uh, understanding and you know, 
I mean, I think at the next slide I have some more details about it. So, so let's take a let's take a real example uh, of, of the same pipeline that we had, right? Uh, we made sensor CSI to generic ISV with scalar and statistics. So one 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 additional thing which is not a part of media controller, but it's still relevant here. It's just called the V4L2 async framework. So what happens is uh, very often you'll find that these drivers uh, they are part of a single platform device. This could be a separate platform device. Some, in some ISPs, they are part of the ISP, but sometimes it could be separated out. And the image sensor almost always is a different driver because that's under the I2C device driver path, right? So, so we need some, some mechanism for these two separate drivers, which are not really a part of the, I, the main ISP driver, to dynamically get added to this pipeline. So, so that is what V4L2 async framework does. So what it does is through device trees uh, mechanisms, right, you can connect, uh, it's called firmware node endpoint, and using that you can connect uh, you know, a CSI2 and an image sensor through the device tree. And then these drivers, they're going to probe and register themselves independently. So these two drivers, uh, the ones which are not a part of the main ISP yet, they are going to make a call, uh, a function call called uh, v, V4L2 subdevice uh, async register. So that that sound that means it's doing an asynchronous registration. So if if this driver comes first, it's going to asynchronously register itself, and if dri if this driver comes later, it's it's going to notice that you know someone has tried to asynchronously register, and it's and both of these drivers are going to get callbacks which is called the bound callback. And in those bound callbacks, you can go and establish these links. You know. So this gives a lot of flexibility because you, know, you, you may have different image sensors, and these are typically determined by the board you're working on. So, so async framework is, is very essential to get a fully functional pipeline. You don't have to put everything into a giant monolithic driver. You can keep things separate, and they can be completely different drivers. And with the help of async framework, they can connect with each other. So that's uh, that's very interesting, and it allows to keep things very modular. So you could you could have one image sensor driver that works with multiple ISPs, right? Or you could have a CSI2 driver that can also work with multiple ISPs. So th there's a lot of flexibility in doing it this way. So once once all the device, uh, all the entities are registers, and you know you've had the bound callbacks, and then you had this is this is also a callback called complete, which uh, normally happens on the root um, ISP driver. And what that tells is that all your entities, you know, via async framework have all registered and it's all done. So at this point, the driver can go and really form the, do the finalization of the media pipeline. So that, that's what the intent of that callback is. So once all of these entities are registered, you know, you do a stream on, you know, on either one of these. So applications can, you know, either start off with streaming on the scalar or the statistics. And at this point, you'd use those media pipeline APIs to, to to, to walk the graph, right? And normally the way you do it is you stream on the entity first and then you you just go uh, upstream. You stream on this, then you stream on this, and then you stream on this. And then you take a look at the pipe, the start count, and you know it's, it's already incremented, and, and especially when you're streaming on the next video device, the statistics, at that point you say, you know what, the ISP is already running, I just turn on the statistics alone. And then when you're streaming off, it, it goes the reverse way, right? You you first stream off the image sensor, then this, and then, then finally these device nodes. And then, you know, the last device, uh, video device that streams off is the one which is actually going to stream off the ISP. So here's an example of the media CTL tool, right? So this is, I think it's a little too small, but uh, I was trying to fit it all in one slide. So, so you can use the media seat. This is this is an example from the Rockchip ISP, which is uh, I think present in RK3399. Uh, so if you if you run this command media CTL minus D and give the name of the media device and give minus P, it's it's going to give this uh, this kind of an output. So so you are going to see the name of the driver, the model of the driver, and all of these different fields that the driver sets, right? And then the next thing is the the output of the G topology, the one we spoke about earlier. And you do see all the different entities here. So there's, there is a mapping here. So you do see how many pads are there here. For example, entity one, that is the ISP uh, sub dev, which corresponds to this particular guy over here. 
it shows that it has four pads, right? And there are two input pads and there's two output pads. Then from one of the output pads, right, the, the number two, the video goes to two output paths, right? Two, two, two sub devs. Uh, one of them is called a main path and a self path. And uh, those have like, you know, diff these are like, I think they are like scalars and other post-processing blocks. And from here, you go down to some video devices which have DMA capability of writing out the video stream. So you also notice that there is a pad here in three uh, from which uh, statistics is pulled out. So there is like a statistics video buffer. Um, and and then interestingly, this the Rockchip guys have done like a virtual video device node, something of that sort, and they use this for the parameters. I mean, there, n normally parameters are done via V4L control, but they have chosen to do it using a, a video buffer. So a video buffer is a param parameter buffer which goes and configures parts of the pipeline. And then there's this image sensor here. So in this particular case, uh, in this particular example of RK ISP1, this entity registered asynchronously using the V4L2 async framework. The rest of the ISP is registered itself. And then when the bound callbacks and complete callback happened, this link was established. And this image sensor became a part of this media pipeline. So there is something called a media request API, which uh, I actually thought that it needs a session of its own. So I'm not going to be covering it here. It's, it's not related to the graphs and other things, but it's related to you know, like the Android health restyle requests and metadata. So it's, it's, it's more on supporting that. So I'll perhaps do another session next, next ELC to cover this in more detail. Um, here are some of the references. Uh, I think I finished about three minutes early. So yeah, if you have more time for questions. So any questions? Uh, so I'm curious to know, uh, like, uh, how do we control the resume sequence? Like, for example, if we're starting the camera, then we have this V4L2 async uh, that has that bound notification, and then we can stream on in the order that you said, right? ISP mm -hmm. first and from mm -hmm. last to first. Yeah. But if we are, like, suspending the device and uh, resuming back, uh, how do we control that uh, same flow, like, Oh, so you mean to say the power management suspend resume? Is yes. That, is that the one? Yeah, so typically, actually, I don't know the right way, but what I would do would monitor the start count. That's an indication that the pipeline is active. And any attempt to suspend while the start count is not zero must be rejected, saying that, you know, I, I actually, you cannot suspend the ISP at this point. It might be possible, but it's very difficult to go and save the state of a running ISP and then restore it exactly from that point, right? But you'd want, normally want to suspend when, when nothing is running, right, you know, or, or the pipeline start count is zero. Yeah, th yeah, that, that's fine. I think uh, when we are looking, uh, we could not find any way to control the sequence of resuming, like after for resuming, we want to, you know, start the ISP first and then the CSI and at last the image sensor. Resume. So at least in my experience, I know there may be a way to do it. In my experience, uh, for ISP suspend resume use cases, right, are normally user space initiated. You do have to tell the application to close the streams and then go to suspend. And yeah. then, you know, because those callbacks can also go to the application side through through some middleware frameworks. Mm -hmm. It's very, very challenging. To, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's challenging and I have not seen any examples of ISPs. But in my scope of things I've yeah, looked at. So. Like for example, how can I control from the bridge driver to say like not to probe the image sensor until uh, it, it has powered on? Like for example, for startup, we have this bound callback and all. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the reverse, like on the resume path, is there like from the bridge driver, how we can control the image sensor to not uh, power on the sensor until the rest of the pipeline is up? 
Yeah, so the bridge driver can do that. Yes, it it, it okay. can do that. Yes. Okay. So, thank uh, you. Basically, that that's the purpose of the the media API, uh, the graph graph traversal one is just to understand that you will realize that image sensor is that the source of the pipeline, right? So through that, you know that it needs to be powered on at the at the end, right? And once you get the handle of its uh, VFRL to sub device, you can make. Uh, stream on calls you can make even s power calls uh, to 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 control that sequence so so the the main uh, owner or the bridge driver like you mentioned can 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 decide that and control it thank you any other questions Okay, if there's no questions, I think we, we learned five minutes early. Thanks a lot for joining this talk, everyone.